Okay. So this is probably not your first Zoom, but we are gonna keep things interactive. Um, please use the chat as much as you uh, want. Um, if you have an insight, a question or something that you wanna engage with, um, there's a lot of collective wisdom in the room today and we encourage you to share your own learnings and reflections. Um, before we jump into the agenda, I just wanted to give us a little bit of grounding, you know, learning and evaluation can be a serious topic. I know it's the middle of the day for many of us. So let's just take a moment to take a breath together and just get grounded before we jump into some heady stuff. Um, so if it's comfortable for you, please uh, close your eyes, maybe turn your video off for a moment. And we're just going to take a few deep breaths together. So on the count of five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And on count of five, we're going to exhale. Five, four, three, two, one. Inhale. Five, four, three, two, one. Exhale. Five, four, three, two, one. Take one very deep breath. As, as much as your lungs can fill up, hold it at the top and then exhale and let it all go. And then shake it off. Thank you. Thanks for doing that with us. All right, um, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Shara Reed to set us up for the day. Take it away, Shara. Yeah, thank you for that, Shadi. So it's really good to be here with you all. And thank you uh, to Shadi and her team at the Trust Based Philanthropy Project for partnering with us um, in our work uh, in conversation. Just to say a little bit about how we got here. We were in conversation, really doing the work of trying to become more in community and asked you know, why do people sometimes not make their way to trust-based philanthropy? And one of the most frequently asked questions or stumbling blocks is around questions of evaluation and learning. And so we decided to team up and to see if we might unstick some of the things that feel stuck for folks. And Shadi will probably say a little bit more about that um, in her remarks. But just to give you a sense of the genesis of what's bringing us here today. Um, so I get the, the pleasure of saying a bit about our program and how we're gonna interact. And the, the, the best part is, and we all know this, if you're on Instagram, social media, the like button, the heart. And this, as Shadi said, can be a heavy topic. A lot of people get stuck here and organizations get stuck. So what we're inviting you to do is on that little reactions button when you hear something that you're appreciating something you can use something that you're like oh let me get out my iphone and i'm gonna tweet about that heart put the heart up right get your instagram pretend you're on the gram get the heart out and use the heart liberally uh, we invite you to uh, to do that to show that you're here whether you're on screen or not use the heart, let us know you're here, let us know what's resonating, um, and we appreciate that. Uh, we also wanna let you know just a little bit about kind of the run of show. Uh, Shadi's gonna give us a bit of an overview of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project. We're going to hear a little bit about questions of learning and evaluation, situate, and then most of our time is going to be spent hearing from our really brilliant panelists. We have three uh, philanthropy executives here, three people who occupy the president, executive director, CEO, ED uh, role in their respective organizations. And we're gonna really um, listen to how they have been bringing learning and evaluation considerations into their work in the organizations they lead uh, and doing that in a way that is sitting with the values and the principles of trust-based philanthropy. And we also have a number of questions that you sent in with your registrations. And so we're gonna talk through some of those that came up most often um, before we turn it over to hear what your questions are in the moment. We also invite you to jot your questions down right in the chat, 
let us know what's working for you. Let us know where your mind is at, what, what's on your heart. What do you, what's like that burning question that had you sign on for today's webinar? Uh, invite you to do that. Um, but otherwise, you know, it might be lunchtime for you. It might be time for a snack. Sit back, relax. Hopefully there's a nugget. There's a wisdom in here, a question that gets a little unstuck for you. Um, but moreover, know that, you know, you're in community with uh, 800 people who are either watching live or who are uh, who are signing in and watching, you know, maybe while after they put their kids to bed or while they have lunch um, at another time zone. So be here with us. We're really glad you're here. And I'm going to pass it back over to Shadi. Thank you so much, Shara. That was wonderful. Um, so I'm going to just jump us right into the program. Um, so today's program is actually not going to be a deep dive into trust-based philanthropy practices. We are really specifically going to be focused on this question of learning and evaluation. We will be talking about some of the trust-based practices that can be optimized to support learning. So you'll hear examples along the way. But just to ground us, um, trust-based philanthropy is an approach to giving that addresses the inherent power imbalances that exist between funders, nonprofits, and the communities they serve. So the core of everything we're gonna be talking about today and the core of everything that we talk about with trust-based philanthropy in general is that this is all about redistributing power and using our roles and our positionality as funders, as those in kind of philanthropic decision-making seats to redistribute that towards systemically, organizationally and interpersonally in service of a healthier and more equitable nonprofit ecosystem. So there are practical manifestations of trust-based philanthropy that you might be familiar with, multi-year unrestricted funding, streamlined applications and reporting. And then this last line, it's a commitment to building relationships based on transparency, dialogue, and mutual learning. And that's kind of the piece we'll be really exploring together today. So before we jump into the rest of the program, would love to just take a quick poll and get a sense from you all. Where are you, where's your organization, or if you're a consultant or a nonprofit, the organizations you work with most frequently, where, where is your organization on the trust-based journey? And so you should see that poll on your screen right now. And we're gonna give um, about 30 seconds for folks to answer, just so we can get a sense of where you're, where you're landing and how you're arriving today. And it looks like we've got about, half of the group, the majority of the group is in, is mid-stage. Um, so we'll give a, just a couple more seconds and we'll take a look at those results. Okay, Caitlin, I think we can go ahead and end the poll and take a look. All right, so welcome. We've got people at all different stages of the journey. A um, majority kind of mid-stage implementing some of the practices, welcome. Um, and those for you who are, who are not engaged or early stage um, and even the late stage folks, I think there's gonna be um, a lot of wisdom to gather from today's discussion. We invite you to pose those questions. And of course, for those of you who are already trying some of these things out, um, please share your reflections and your comments. Um, we hope to really tap the collective wisdom in the room. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing. So I don't know how to close, okay, there we go. All righty. So we talk about power and power imbalances in the sector and how does this actually show up in our evaluation practices? And this image just gives you a sense of the types of questions and demands that many nonprofit leaders face. And oftentimes when it comes to evaluation and learning, there tends to be in the industry standard of how these are approached from, from foundations to nonprofits, oftentimes it's foundations making decisions about what is measured and how those measures are captured. So if you imagine a non one nonprofit leader kind of navigating multiple funder relationships and all the different range of requests that come to these nonprofit leaders, you know, you've got kind of the, the remnants of the strategic philanthropy movement in the upper left corner, where there, there has been this industry tendency in the past, and it continues to have foundations define a theory of change, often not with a lot of input from those who experience those issues, 
um, and they come up with a theory of change and then grantee partners are requested to make the case for how their work fits into that theory of change. You also see a lot of evaluation related questions, metrics related questions showing up in grant reporting. So in the bottom left, you know, the request for concrete numbers that prove that a small grant made a significant impact on a deeply complex issue. And of course, this is slightly satirized to give you a sense of kind of how that might come off to a leader who is actually living and breathing this work every day in community, thinking intentionally about long-term social change issues often that are not often very easy to quantify. We'll all, we also see this in our um, in applications. You know, where nonprofits, when they're filling out grant applications, have to demonstrate how a grant of you know small and large size, you know various sizes, have to prove or have to make the case for a measurable impact, specific with specific points in a 12-month time frame. And then the final point here too, there's just another example of of something nonprofit leaders will often hear is that then they, you know, they, they might be suggested to get a apply for a capacity building grant so that they get better at quantifying the impact of their work over time. And this is just an example of the tendencies that many nonprofit leaders face, the various types of questions. And then really, if you look at all of these examples here, the, it's, the, it's very foundation centric. There's not a lot of listening space. There's not a lot of uh, acknowledgement of the wisdom and expertise of the leaders that are working within the issues. So fundamentally, when we talk about trust-based philanthropy, we're talking about recognizing that these power imbalances are showing up in every way and they do really get perpetuated in our evaluation practices. So there's other ways to think about it and there's other ways to do this. So trust-based philanthropy fundamentally, regardless of how the practices are expressed, is a values-based approach. So for funders that align with this approach, that, that, that really lead with values, this is the common denominator across. It might look a little different. You'll hear different stories today about how the work looks different and the expressions of this work don't look identical across organizations, but the core values are what ties us all together. It's a commitment for systemic equity addressing and acknowledging that we we operate in an inequitable system where power has been held in the hands of a few and work and seeing our role as funders to work toward a vision of systemic equity that requires us to redistribute power recognize where power is held recognize the limitations when power is held in the hands of a few and see the opportunity and the potential of redistributing that power toward greater impact it's a, a value of centering relationships, recognizing that if we need to, if we want to get anything done in our world, we rely on relationships. Those, that's our social currency. It allows us to get to where we want to go. It's about recognizing that as funders, our job is not to monitor and, and, and push for compliance. Our job is actually to partner in a spirit of service to the movement leaders, the organizations that are doing the work. How can, again, we use our power and redistribute that in service of the goals of the communities and the leaders that we support? It's about seeing our role as being accountable to those that we support. So many of our traditional and, and some of the industry standard approaches reinforce a one-way accountability where, where nonprofit leaders and community partners are held accountable to the funder and so much of their energy goes toward that. And if you think about it, if we want to see nonprofits achieving impact, we need to give them some space and, 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 and leeway to focus, be accountable to the communities that they're serving. So how can we as funders see our role in supporting that and nurturing that? And finally, this is about embracing learning, recognizing that we as funders don't have all the answers. Not one person has all the answers to everything, and we don't have it all figured out. Many of us are working within deeply complex ecosystems where we need to embrace learning as we go in order to figure out how we can get to that vision together with our partners. So these are the values you will hear today as we hear examples of how learning and evaluation is embraced by trust-based funders. It's really about centering these values in the, in the inquiry, in the learning. So, 
a values-based approach to evaluation is about holding us accountable to our values, our partners, and one another, allows us to learn about our work in order to improve, refine, and make better decisions, make better grant-making decisions. And then it can also help us understand that big picture collective progress in the ecosystem that we're operating in. And so we are, you're gonna hear about these three, this three-pronged approach. And so how do we center trust-based values in our learning and evaluation? And it really falls in these three buckets. Learning for accountability. How can we use learning? How can we use our processes and systems of learning to actually hold ourselves accountable to living into our values? Hold ourselves accountable to our grantee partners. It's about learning for better decision-making. How are we learning about the support that we're providing our grantee partners? How are we helping them in achieving their goals? How are we helping contribute to a stronger nonprofit ecosystem? And then ultimately, you know, it is also about learning for long-term impact, but these are long-term measures. These are things that can't be measured in 12 months or even 24 months. We're talking about five, 10, 20 years, looking over time and, how, and what changes are we seeing over time and how can our grantee partners and our community partners help inform that analysis? So we're still, what we're talking about here is a, requires a lot of rigor and it, it requires, again, that learning mindset, but again, with, a, with an intentionality around improving. So we're not trying to prove, but we're trying to improve. And you'll, again, you'll hear some, some examples of that shortly. So I just wanted to get us grounded. Um, I'd love to hand it off to Shara at the Center for Evaluation Innovation to just ground some of this in some, some thinking around how does this all fit into the industry standards around evaluation? So Shadi, I very much appreciate that grounding. And part of what you made really clear is that trust-based philanthropy is not neutral. In other words, it's for a purpose. It has a clear purpose and you name that. And so when we're moving in a context where we do have values in our organizations, where we have a clear mission, we're not neutral, right? We are not neutral. We are not outside the social contract for the work that we are intending to do in our respective organizations. We are part of, right? We have clear values, we have a mission. And so it has to follow that our methods, that our approaches, our stance, it has to follow the values and the missions of our organizations, right? And so, so often our industry standard and evaluation the way that we think about it is rooted in the model of evaluating social programs, social reforms, right? Dating back to the 80s and the 90s with like really the federal government. And I would posit that there is a time and there is a place for understanding social reforms and programs that the government, the federal government means to scale up. And most of us, those of us who are working in philanthropy and working around philanthropy, we're in a different business. We may be working in concert or in relationship with our local governments, with our federal governments, and we are in a, a, another world of really, in many cases, working at a scale of a neighborhood, a city, a state, a locale. We are often working across multiple issues and not isolating out one thing in our work. We are people, many of us, who are in the, the work of complex systems change, right? One of my colleagues from the Kresge Foundation, when I worked there, used to say that we want to organize our programs, our work in verticals. People live their lives horizontally. And that was David Fukuzawa, who used to say that a long time health funder. And if we really believe that people live their lives horizontally, if we have learned anything in the pandemic from our cats walking by to our babies on our laps, right? Uh, to our Zoom failures uh, with the internet cutting out is 
Yep, that's true for those of us, including those of us who are in white collar jobs and get to work from home, right? We are living our lives horizontally across issues, across needs, across all facets. And so when we go then to our learning and to our evaluation, it's got to follow, right? And so we may have this desire to know without a doubt. We want certainty and we get it. We want things to be changed. We want things shifted. We want urgency, right? We want, as we have heard many times over in our history, we want all deliberate speed, right? And we are working in institutions, structures, and systems. And we are working in ways that are responsive to people and disinvested communities across the country, across the globe at times. And so as a sector, we are trying to become much better listeners quickly, if anything. We are coming to be much better sense makers if we can, right? We are learning more how to wield, how to share, how to yield power. And we have to be robust and rigorous in our approaches, right? And so I would just uh, remind that for many of us, nearly all, if not everybody here, we are in the business of contribution rather than attribution, right? We are in the business of really making our highest and best contribution to what we are working on in our systems change work and our responsive work we are part of a larger ecosystem, a number of actors. You can even look, I don't know if people follow those New York Times headlines and have been reading about direct cash payments to new mothers, right? There's work there that's really about what? Direct cash payments, new mothers, and everybody wants to know how and why. So there's some correlation between direct cash payments and baby's brain development. That's amazing. But, but how? But why? But did the mothers have to get on a bus and ride for an hour to go work at a low wage job to get that money? No. Did they, were they required to only buy food that's approved by WIC? No. How? Why? Why does it happen? So this is speaking to our really our need to understand context. And we would posit that evaluation that brings it into service of really trying to understand the how, the why, that is aligned with values, aligned with our missions, right? That are about often complex social change, that are about being responsive to people in disinvested communities can be a very, deeply respectful act. It need not be an extractive industry standard that leaves people feeling strapped, that is rooted in the foundation kind of reifying its own power. And that's what we're here to talk about today. How do we move toward a framework for learning and evaluation in a trust-based context? And so I'm gonna be passing it on to our panelists and just to say a brief word about who's gonna be speaking in the order. We're gonna be hearing from Brenda Sorlerzano from the Headwaters Foundation in Montana. We're gonna be hearing from Carrie Avery from the Durfee Foundation in California. We're going to be hearing from Philip Lee from the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation in New York City. And so we are signing in from all different parts of the country um, and all of our panelists are here to say a bit about their stories. And we will be, again, having some opportunity for some from Q&A and we have a few questions that are teed up uh, based on your registration uh, questions. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Brenda Sorlozano from the Headwaters Foundation. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be in community with you today to talk a little bit about 
the work that we've been doing at Headwaters here in Montana. I, I wanna start off first by sharing that we are a private health conversion foundation. We're a foundation that works on social determinants of health, and we are focused on addressing systems change within social determinants of health. We have picked issues that the community told us are the ones we need to focus on, which are early childhood, food security, and American Indian health disparities. It's really important, I think, if we're going to be a trust-based foundation for us to be very clear and very specific about what we're working on and who we're working with. Sometimes we're not, we wanna be everything to everyone as foundations, and I think that makes it challenging to be a trust-based funder. And I'm sharing this because at Headwaters, we've learned that the more refined and focused we are, the easier it is to adopt and implement some of these practices. The other thing I wanna share with you is that I have spent about 20 years of my life working in the land of philanthropy and held many strong uh, sector driven uh, approaches to evaluation and learning. Uh, ideas such as success is defined by the foundation that we can change the world with a $250,000 grant over a two year period that the foundation can measure its impact even though we actually are not doing the work. And that we have tons of grantee reports come, that come in, which we never really read. And that we have presented, or I have presented lots of data to boards that have been data that has been manipulated. Um, and that uh, we're, we, we know what we're doing, we're defining success. And the reason I wanna share that is that I've been on this journey of having to unlearn all of those paradigms in order to get to where I am today at Headwaters. So the first thing I did was to really create a culture of learning and, and embedded in everything that we do as a foundation. I've had other experiences where I've tried to drive a learning organization by doing evaluation work and then surprised to find out that we had no practices anywhere in really being a learning organization. So just a few specific examples of what this has looked like. We embed learning in everything. It is in our job descriptions and it is an expectation that everybody, everybody does learning. I make sure that everybody on my team has learning time on their calendars. It is an important component of their work and they have to make time to do this. We also include learning into our budgeting. Budgeting is sort of your strategy and numbers. And if you don't actually include that, then there is no way for the organization to make a commitment to learning. So that's the very first piece, right? To really create a strong learning culture requires you to embed it in everything. And I have to share with you some examples of how we've done that. We have also really thought about how can communities help us define what success is, as opposed to myself, my board, or experts we hire define what success looks like. So we actually went through a process with uh, our evaluation consultants that was FSG in developing a theory of change. But instead of starting with it internally and then sharing it with our grantees for input or defining all of the measures ahead of time, we went through a process where our grantees were the ones that developed the theory of change that includes everything, all the components that you would expect to see in our theory of change including the outcomes that our grantees hope to see as a result of being partners with Headwaters, and also the impacts that they hope to see over time. Um, that's a, it was a very big paradigm shift to go from the board approving and defining to the grantees defining and setting out expectations. Um, and I'm happy to share that theory of change with anybody if you're interested in seeing it. Uh, but it is a robust theory of change that I think really creates a shared roadmap, roadmap between the foundation and our grantees and allows everybody to be aligned on what it is that we're actually trying to achieve. The other thing that we, need to do, we needed to do at Headwaters was to work with the board to help them reimagine what evaluation is for. So it's not to pat ourselves on the back. It's not to make ourselves feel good about what we're doing. It's really an approach to thinking about what are we hearing from our communities and our grantees and how are we using that information to make decisions about how we allocate our resources going forward. And that requires us to sit and listen 
to observe and to actually work in partners with our grantees and bring that information to bear with our board. So I'll give you a real quick example of how this worked. Over this last year, we've been hearing from our grantees through some conversations. It was very clear that they needed some longer term funding than what we were providing. It was consistent across all of our grantees in the stories that they were sharing and the work that they were preparing as they think about the legislative session next year and what systems change they wanna work on social determinants of health. We brought all of that information to our board and our board engaged in a conversation where they decided to actually double our grant making last year based on what we were hearing from our grantees in order to ensure that we are better prepared for the next legislative session and for our grantees to have what they needed. So that's been a huge process and one that continues. So educating our board started with changing their paradigm bringing them along. And there are still times when some of them say, where's the data sheet, Brenda? Where's the graph? Where's the bars? And I have to consistently do an education process. And I don't think that's ever gonna change, especially as our board transitions. The other thing that we've had to reimagine is our staff roles. So at Headwaters, instead of focused on putting out RFPs, uh, reviewing proposals, reviewing grantee reports, uh, doing dockets for board presentations. Our staff are more thought partners. They are sitting and listening. They are collecting information based on the conversations that they're having with our grantee organizations. They're bringing those themes that they're hearing into learning themes back to conversations to our board. It's a, it's a different approach where everyone gets to benefit. One of the first things that we needed to do in addition to reimagining the staff role was really creating a tool by which we could as an organization understand what was happening as a result of the work that we were doing around supporting grantees and communities in Montana. So we actually created a learning book, a learning book that is made up of the three functions that Shadi described in, in a different approach to evaluation when you apply a trust-based lens. The first section of the learning book is one that I call learning for accountability. And what this measures is those things that we actually at the foundation have control over, connected to how are we living our values and goals. And we actually look at this data on a quarterly basis and we talk about it at our board meetings. It allows us to also, as a staff, think about performance review for, our, for how we hold ourselves accountable for the work that we're doing. The second section of the board book is one that I call learning for decision making. It is connected to the indicators that are part of our theory of change. And each indicator has a page in our learning book that includes stories, staff reflections based on what they're hearing, highlights that are important to show about how the work is progressing. It includes a numbers section that describes some of the impact that we're seeing. Um, and all of this information is inputted by our staff into our grants management system, which we've had to reimagine into a knowledge management system as opposed to a grants management system. And that is um, something that we can pull data from and that we can bring specific conversations to the board. And that's, that's what we use to allow the board to see how it is that data can be useful and how we can have strategic learning conversations based on what we're hearing. The last section is a, is a section where, that we call long-term indicators. And like Shadi described, these are things that we're hoping to see change, right? Because we're a systems change funder. So we want to see the indicators around early childhood and food security and American Indian health disparities the needles on those indicators move in positive directions because there will be an indication of whether or not the work that we're supporting is making a difference. And those things are things that we should be tracking and looking at over time. And we're only going to be looking at these at five and 10 year increments because that's really the, the only way that we're going to be able to see something move on that level. And I think that's a big shift from where I was before, where as a foundation, we were trying to move those long-term indicators and measure them on a yearly basis or every three-year basis. It's a shift for us at Headwaters to say, yeah, that's what, we're, that's what we're hoping to move, but that's not what we're doing because our one grant isn't going to be responsible for those changes. But we do need to understand the, the ecosystem in which we're working to be able to 
um, to look at that. So the practical tools are really the, that I could share with everybody is the theory of change that we've developed that really was defined by our grantees, the learning data book that has these different sections that actually has become something tangible for our staff and our board to work. And we're gonna be releasing it publicly because we believe that the learning is important for our grantees and the communities that they serve as well. And then the last thing that I, I wanna just highlight is that we've shifted from grantee reports to our staff interviewing um, uh, our grantees. And so we, we sit and have coffee chats with them and learn and bring that information. And our staff actually comes back and enters it into our knowledge management system, i.e. our grant system, so that and, and codes it so that we can actually pull this data. Um, and I think that's a great, um, it's, a, it's a different way and a different role for our, for our staff to be engaged in. But I can tell you that some of the information that we've learned um, has been more transparent and more honest and more reflective of what our grantees are dealing with than any other grantee report that I have read in my 20 years in philanthropy. Um, so with that, because I know we've got lots to learn from, uh, from Phil and Carrie, I'm going to close there. Wow. Brenda, that was like a mic drop, if I do say so myself, to quote Jay-Z. <laughs> that was a mic drop, if I do say so myself. Um, and so I just to to recap, because this is a lot of information and we're going to be transitioning over to hear from our next speaker. So Brenda is from the Headwaters Foundation. They are a systems change funder. And you heard her talking. She's been in philanthropy, worked uh, in a, a different organization over the last two plus decades and is speaking about the paradigm shifts, the role shifts that are required when we take a trust-based approach and we are rigorous and robust in our commitment to learning and evaluation, right? From the paradigm shift for the board to grantees developing the theory of change and setting expectations, questions of accountability, right? Really shifting and a shift in the roles of the staff. Reimagining, I think was the word that Brenda uh, one of the words Brenda used to talk about it. And there is ongoing work to continue to engage and to, to move the board. Um, and it is a robust, a rigorous uh, approach. And so we uh, say thank you, Brenda, for laying all of that out. Thank you for your willingness also to share resources as you go. And our next panelist we're going to hear from is Carrie Avery from the Durfee Foundation. And Carrie's gonna to talk to us at least in part about learning for long-term impact. Uh, they've been doing some really fabulous work there. So Carrie. Thank you. Although it's a little intimidating to have to pick up the mic after the mic drop of, um, <laughs> of Brenda and, uh, and um, follow her. But um, hi everybody, I'm Carrie Avery with the Durfee Foundation in Los Angeles. And Durfee is a family foundation. We've been around for a long time. We were founded in 1960. Um, we have a small staff of four. We have a board right now of seven family and community members. And our, we, are, we call ourselves issue agnostic, but place-based. Um, we fund all kinds of organizations but they're based in Los Angeles County, um, which is home to 10 million people. And our main focus is the people who are making change in Los Angeles and supporting them. And we run a number of different programs to do so. We have our Springboard program that funds newer nonprofit groups um, or even groups that are not yet nonprofits. Um, we give them general operating support, mentorship, and help them grow over the long term. We have a sabbatical program for nonprofit leaders where we make grants to organizations to allow their executive directors to take a three-month break from work and provide a lot of wraparound support for the organizations to manage and thrive when the leader is gone and when the leader returns. Um, we have a new program that we just launched uh, the, this past year called the Lark Awards which is a grant to smaller organizations for the collective care of their staff that we um, realize is incredibly necessary after everything that the, the 2020s have wrought. Um, we're very DIY when it comes to learning because we see ourselves and our small team in a continuous loop of 
learning, iteration, implementation, we were founded by an inventor. And we have that as really part of our DNA is that we see ourselves as having a, a tinkering culture. We're never done. We're always, you know, looking at things and figuring out how we can, how we can improve them. So I was asked to talk about assessing long-term impact and, um, one of the ways that we've focused on this is through our sabbatical program, which was launched 25 years ago in 1997. Um, and, and we launched the sabbatical program in response to what we heard from the field about the demands of being a nonprofit executive director, um, which are legion. And um, we're looking for a lot of different levels of impact. You know, the very basic level is the, you know, the restoration and rejuvenation of a hardworking executive director also strengthening the bench of the entire staff at the organization and working with, with them to distribute leadership throughout the organization. And then there's this big picture systems change goal of um, no less than you know, trying to change the nonprofit burnout culture where people feel like they have to sacrifice everything from their financial to their physical health to the cause and, and people feel like unless they're doing, working 24 seven, 365 days a year, then they're not truly dedicated. But of course we know and research shows that this is actually counterproductive. It's not good for people, it's not good for causes, it's not good for organizations to have this, um, this type of work ethic. So, um, we gather information in a lot of ways. We've done some very sort of conventional model studies. We did a meta study with four other sabbatical programs nationally. We pooled our funds. We got outside evaluators to um, study the impacts of the leader taking a three month break and then coming back. And um, not surprisingly, because we had a lot of anecdotal information to back this up, but we, we were able to show with the charts and the graphs um, that, that um, sabbaticals are beneficial to boards, to leaders, to the entire organization, to the communities. Um, and that's been, it's been really helpful to us to have the charts and the graphs and the reports to share with other funders. It's uh, allowed for an uptake from other funders of, of implementing their own sabbatical programs. And also it helps um, nonprofit EDs, they can show this to their board chair to say, I want to take a sabbatical and here this shows that it will not tank our organization, which is um, a myth that um, a lot of board chairs seem to have. Um, we've also did a 20 year longitudinal study of just our Durfee sabbatical program a few years ago. Um, to, to track the progress on the Los Angeles region and um, and that's been very helpful as well, because we really have been moving the needle on changing the the um, the attitudes about about work and about work in the nonprofit sector and the realization when we launched the program, the um, we heard from funders, we heard from nonprofits that they were concerned that if somebody took a sabbatical, they would leave and they would never come back. And now that we've had more than a hundred people who have gone through our program and they haven't left and not come back. And in fact, their organizations have thrived and um, grown and, um, and so many good things have happened as a result of those sabbaticals that um, it really is changing the, the impression of what it means to, to pace yourself in work. Um, and then we also, we gather information constantly in informal ways. We have regular gatherings of our sabbatical alums. We um, plan retreats with them. We ask them what, what do they wanna talk about? And that way we're in this continuous feedback loop of what do, what do um, nonprofit leaders need? What do their organizations need? Um, this is how we developed our LARC awards was from listening to nonprofit leaders, listening to people on the ground about how, um, completely burned out um, nonprofit staff are uh, after meeting the challenges of COVID and the racial reckoning and everything else that's been going on um, and realizing that we really needed to um, develop a program to focus on the collective care of people working at, of the staff working at nonprofits. Um, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll stop there because I wanna hear from Phil. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. And Phil, before you come on, I just want to reiterate a few of the things that Carrie said that I think are really important for us to hear. Um, so Carrie, that was a beautiful story. Um, and I would say that's a mic drop that you've had a sabbatical program at Durfee since 1997. 
right? For those of us, um, I will say, and I speak from my own place, my generation, those of us who are uh, resisting or pushing back against grind culture, right? And we are saying that rest is necessary in this work. You all have been at that for more than 25 years, right? That is a really beautiful thing. And you've got the receipts, right? As some people would say, um, to show that, you know, it, it turns out that leaders come back rejuvenated, not necessarily leaving as a result of sabbatical, as you said, that organizations can be strengthened during that time. And so uh, that is a really important uh, perspective for us to hear about why in a trust-based context, why evaluation and learning are so important, why taking a long-term view is important. Um, and for all of us who may be working in a context where uh, we have people who want stakeholders who wanna know today, wanna know in six months or in a year, did we do all the things? Uh, just underlining here in this context, we're talking about two plus decades of work at changing mindsets around sabbatical and what contribution then that is making to the sector writ large. So Durfee may be place-based issue agnostic and I'm hearing a huge contribution on the importance of fully supporting uh, leaders in their organ in their nonprofit organizations and rest as an important part of that. So thank you for that. And thank you to Durfee. Um, and Philip uh, Lee from the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation is going to share some perspective next. Oh man, it's it's tough to go last here amongst this group. <laughs> uh, but hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be with you today and share a bit of our journey. And so I am actually a relative newbie um, uh, in the sector, though it's been 10 years. So I don't think I can say that anymore, but spent the first half of my career in finance and on Wall Street and then came to nonprofit and have been coming up on six years here at Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, which is about 60 years old. Uh, it is Singer Sewing Machine Legacy Resources, so a little bit of the fabricating and putting things together and exploring in that way as well, an inventor. Um, and we are a private foundation, and uh, I love Carrie's language, so I'm going to co-opt that, but uh, we're place-based funders that are also issue agnostic in that way. Um, we actually are really interested in uh, creating a more vibrant and equitable New York. And we do that by investing in our people. So we're really interested in leadership development per se. And so we fund organizations across the city um, who are identifying leaders that are hopefully going to change the nature and the arc of what New York looks like and make it for the better. Um, and so it's everything from uh, looking at justice reform to food security, to affordable housing, uh, to looking at the built environment and the arts. So. It is a whole array of groups that are trying and endeavoring to uh, make New York more vibrant and equitable and really using all these different ways that they're looking at it. Um, as we were talking about, it's not vertical, it's horizontal, right? Everything is related and interacts with everything else. And that's really a big part of our work as well. Um, but when I came to the foundation six years ago, that was a pivot and a change for us as an institution. Um, and so I came with a mindset as someone who was uh, an ED for many years about the desire to like, if I'm ever in that role, I would love to do it differently. And so notions of general operating support and multi-year funding uh, were really present for me and thought if, if we have that opportunity, we do that. And that is actually what uh, Robert Storm Clark has offered in terms of really being able to go out there and try to change the way that we do our work. And so... Um, all of our grants are multi-year in that way and general operating and just even some of the ways that we do the work in terms of simplifying and taking anybody's uh, grant application um, as like the, uh, the submission to us. But uh, on, the, on the flip side, on the back side, and I think that's really where I'm going to spend a part of our time, uh, has been really on looking at you know, evaluation and assessment and looking at what we are, are up to in that work. And um, in accordance with sort of simplifying on the front end, we were also looking at that at the back end, but it took us a little while to get there. And so I'll, I'll share a little bit of this story because actually a, a part of that is really the 
accountability and learning uh, that we got as an institution when we first started. Um, but originally, because all of our grantees sit in different places and work on different issues, there's not really a single rubric that will work in terms of all like taking a look and understanding what's going on. And so we thought we would try to create something um, and use an online capacity assessment tool as a way to sort of see not just how they as an individual's organizations were doing, but to assess ourselves in a more portfolio assessment um, and sort of seeing, are we helping um, move the needle here in New York, if you will? And the proxy was stronger organizations and giving stronger results, uh, self-assessed. Uh, would be a way that we could use an indicator of some sort that would be common across. And so what we would do is we would redact all the information and they would get the report that they had. And so they, they could use that in terms of understanding like, oh, compared to a benchmark, this is where we might want to allocate some of our resources. So we viewed that as kind of a win-win opportunity, if you will, that we would get a, uh, uh, a way to look at ourselves and then our grantees would have a tool that they might use for themselves. Um, in the first year, everybody did it and we're like, okay, here we are, we have our own baseline. And then year two, um, we go gangbusters into it and only a quarter of the groups filled it out uh, and when we got there. And long story short, we got this feedback and it, and it was painful, but I like greatly appreciated like, hey, Bill and Robert Stone Clark, your grant your little grant is not the thing that is changing what's happening in the city or even in our organization. And you need to understand that. And it was a wake up call and it was really important and it was greatly appreciated after a bit of the shock, but we immediately suspended that program. And what we were trying to do is tell the groups that we were really interested in honestly making the case for more unrestricted funding for the sector. and. We were trying to find a mechanism or a way to do that, but also get information that was useful for us. So twofold. And what happened is um, when we told them that that was what we were trying to do, we had seven of our grantee partners, the folks who are doing a lot of this work saying, we love that, let us help you. And so we actually sat uh, our external evaluators and this group of grantee partner colleagues sat down and devised and came up with some rough ideas, including the chat, which is what we use right now, which is the check-in analysis tool, which is a verbal reporting system that we use to this day. And it is an annual opportunity for us and our grantee partners to sit down and talk and hear what's going on, what they're learning, what the challenges are, uh, telling us how we can be better, talking about, um, we give every one of our grantee partners also a professional development award on top of the grant. And so we ask what that's for. And you know, years before a lot of the racial equity stuff was coming forward, we heard from them as almost like a precursor that that's what they were hiring consultants to do to help them do their work. And so it has been, I would say, one of the most interesting and robust ways that we have been able to sort of be better partners to learn and to hear. I would say the information that we get from these conversations and we share the questions in advance. So it's not a gotcha type of thing and we're going to try and pigeonhole you or corner you in a particular way, but it's really um, an opportunity for us and for them to one, build relationship, but also to really learn and then we can explore things. You can't get that in a written report. If there's like, what does that really mean? Or what's going on there? What do you think? It's such a different way uh, for us um, to do the work and echoing what both Brenda and Carrie have been saying, but it changes the nature of our roles, right? We aren't the gatekeepers. We are not the compliance officers, right? We are hopefully kind of to the extent that they would want that, either trusted advisors or counsel or places that they can go to. And I would say, I would say that moment where we got basically told that the tool that we were using wasn't helpful in our action around that gave us more credibility than anything we could ever say, right? That action was demonstrable and sort of saying they listened to us and they took action. Um, and I think, we have 
been privileged that many of them continue to share that information. And when the pandemic came, really we heard from a number of them very quickly about things that they were struggling with, especially initially EDs who were like, I need to be strong. I need to be, hold it together. I have nowhere else to turn, I'm lonely. And so one of our responses was to create an executive director circle based on what they were sharing with us and externally facilitated, but kind of heard there. And then we created a resource bank. A lot of them like, I don't have legal counsel inside or HR or any of these other functions, but I'm really into dire need of like those supports. So we uh, arranged with um, external experts to serve in those roles to help doing that, you know, whether it's managing remotely and all those kinds of things. And so being able to listen and make different kinds of decisions based on what we're hearing and having our grantees be comfortable saying like, I'm really nervous, I'm scared and I don't know where else to go is actually, um, it's terrible to hear, but also be reassuring that they're comfortable enough to come and talk to us about kind of some of the things that are sitting with them. So um, I know in terms of like, we have external evaluators who actually, we do record them at, with the approval of our grantee partners. Um, and what happens is, a random sample are picked by our external evaluators each year, and they listen for different aspects of what they believe build a relationship and trust. And open. so it's openness, it's candor, right? It's us being open as well. And we get um, a look and a lens on ourselves, right? Because in the end, we are evaluating ourselves as funders. How good a partner are we to you? And that's really what the crux is for us. And so I use the handle return on relationship as opposed to ROI, even though I come from the world of finance, but that actually is the real indicator for us as an institution, like our, how, how well are we supporting the folks that in groups that are doing the work that we really believe in? And that is kind of the way that we take our frame in terms of looking at ourselves and hopefully contributing to New York. So I'll leave it at that. Oh. Thank you so much, Phil. That was really excellent. Um, and if you did missed it, from return on investment, ROI, to return on relationship, ROR, right? And Philip gave us a really great example of what happens when you make a deep commitment to transparency and what it looks like to shift accountability, what follows and your grant making practice and what follows in relationship and what opportunities open up for learning. Um, and I wanted to just name, I, I, um, I love this moment, Phil, when you said, you know, you were talking about this, uh, this part that it was people, only a quarter of the folks filled it out, right? And then you, you get to asking and being really transparent and you have folks who say, we love that, let us help you. <laughs> right? Th that sounds radical. That is, and I, I just under, underlined, put a star by it in terms of the value of really radical transparency when you do that from the position in this case of being a funder, what that opens up, how that creates context for everyone to learn, to be able to move and go forward together. Let us help you. Um, is such a flip of the script in the way that many people think of what philanthropy is about in the direction it flows, um, who is responsible for what. And you named that in your work, you have moved uh, in the reimagining of role, similar to Brenda, going from uh, whatever the role, however it was conceived of, probably more industry standard, to the role of being more of a trusted advisor. Um, and uh, it was really beautifully done. Um, I wanna pause here and just show some love for our panelists, Philip Lee, Carrie Avery, Brenda Sorlorzano. They really have brought it with candor, with their own transparency, storytelling as foundation leaders. They are walking the walk, as we say and we appreciate you sharing with us. And so there are uh, questions coming. We have some moderated 
um, moderators who are going to be putting some questions into the chat and uh, see what's coming up uh, for us. So we invite you, if you haven't asked your question already, or if you have a burning question, take a moment to drop it in the chat to make sure we see it. We have questions ahead of time coming in that I think we've touched on. So we had questions coming in about attribution and contribution in a trust-based context. I think we have talked a bit about that. We have questions about sort of what about your board? Uh, and we've talked a bit about that. Did your board, did they join on right away? Did you have to move your board? What's that like? Um, and we, of course, welcome more, more experiences there. And someone, at, someone is asking, and I think maybe a couple people have asked, um, are there examples of what kind of good looks like? Or are we, all, are we all building the plane as we're flying it when it comes to evaluation and learning in a trust-based context? Are we all building the plane or is there a, is there a point of arrival um, with these planes? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause on that one because it's that kind of question comes a lot. And I'm really curious to hear if one or more of our uh, panelists to respond to that. So I'll jump in because this morning I was having a conversation with our program director here at Headwaters and uh, we're in the process of um, revamping our learning book uh, because some of the information we collected was not useful last year. And some of the information uh, that we learned we didn't include. And so I'm not sure that it's a destination. I think it's continual learning. I'm, I'm a fan of saying that we always can learn. Um, you never stop that. And so I'm not sure that you would ever get to a we're done, this is it. You, you have to constantly evolve and learn. Um, that's sort of my, my perspective on this. I'd love to hear what Carrie and Phil um, have to say. In terms of the board, I think the board piece is really important. And one of the things that I've learned in my career is that um, we sometimes let what we think the board wants or needs drive what we end up doing. And I think it takes courage to say, what if we do it differently? Um, and that means that you have to engage in challenging conversations that are hard because you have to push back a little bit on what industry standard um, might be around evaluation and learning. And um, that sometimes can be scary when you go to your board and say, no, that's not what we're going to do. Um, and it also is a long process. So we started working with our board um, right when we started our grant making about uh, three years ago. And we just got them the first full completed learning book last year. And it's been a whole series of conversations. Um, and it's sometimes two steps forward, one step back um, that we do with our board. Um, but I think we have to have, as, as people who had these foundations, the boldness, the innovation to push on our boards to think differently and creatively when it comes to this work. And at the end of the day, we all care about the same thing. We all want to have impact. I'm not in this job just to, you know, not have an impact. And I think our grantees care the same about the same thing as our board. And the more we can align behind that and reinvent this, I think the, the better it will be. Yeah, regarding the board, um, we uh, had a, did an experiment um, this last summer where we were having a board retreat and we invited, it was like right before Delta, so it was right in that sweet spot, where everybody's vaccinated and we can do things together. And um, we invited a number of our nonprofit leaders to come and meet with the Durfee board and staff and we set it up to have real deep conversations because I think it's the continuous learning is also is is grounded in empathy and um, and we wanted our nonprofit leaders to um, learn from the board and so we had we set it up for conversations where first the board and staff would ask questions of the nonprofit leaders in small group conversations and then we flipped it you know like what you know what what makes you do what you do and what keeps you up at night and what are some of the challenges and then we flipped it and we gave equal time to the nonprofit leaders to ask the board and staff about themselves and why do they do what they do and what keeps them up at night and um and then we had lunch together with no agenda and i think that 
that process of relationship building is, I mean, our board is great and we've always had this learning mindset. Um, so it, it, I, I haven't had to convince our board of this, but I think exercises like that can really deepen the empathy and, um, and it, bring, it brings it to life, what this continuous learning is all about and what it's for. I love what you've been doing, um, Carrie, on that front in terms of bringing in your Banty partners and sharing their stories. Um, I'll just do a full rewind back on the board related stuff. Um, when I first got to the foundation and was really interested in um, looking at general operating support in multi-year, I didn't even know the phrase trust-based existed at the time, right? So it was before that. But um, the, the exercise that we went through or the conversation we had was like, how do we as a foundation want to be perceived or seen in this community? And it was really um, completely values driven in terms of being a good partner, being responsive, all these different kinds of things. And that was how we made our way into trust based and having the board buy into kind of these ideas that sort of sit there. And I think that was an important journey for us because instead of kind of trying to strong arm the board into that, it was really kind of them creating this pathway that led to this, um, this idea about all general operating support um, and multi-year and things like that. Um, and I think that has been really important for us as an institution, right? Um, being bold and going there, even the leadership development thing um, was like, okay, this is a little different. We're used to issue-based work, um, but we will explore that and see what that means. And I think um, one of my colleagues um, calls uh, our board adventurous and uh, willing to experiment. And I think that just comes through. And as Carrie and Brenda were both saying, there's sort of that learning stance is really key and having a curiosity or being willing to go out and sort of see if something different works. And that's how our chat has really evolved and being able to share and have even our grantees come back and talk about how different that process is. And, um, and it is the weird thing for me, I would say, is that a number of our grantees actually ask for multiple chats a year because they say we have different kind of conversation with each other rather than the operational aspects of the work when others are around or can add insight. But, but really that whole journey of kind of bringing the board and having them and um, appreciate and see like there is a different kind of thing or ethos that's going on, that's part of our DNA that um, they appreciate and see and hear from um, our partners as well. Thank you. I'm gonna, we have about three questions that I think are bubbling up. I wanna see how many of them we can uh, get to. And so I'm, I'm gonna name all three uh, in case we don't get through all three so we, we hear them. So one is about quantitative and qualitative approaches in your work and how do you approach that? Does it matter? Uh, so can you kind of provide some reflections there? There's a question about the robustness of learning depending upon grant scope. Is there a difference with uh, an initiative um, compared to a single grant or a grant of a particular duration, grant amount, uh, does, does anything change and why? Uh, and there's a question, um, actually four questions. So I already backtrack, I'm gonna say the three and four. There's a question about um, getting, about uh, requesting grantee feedback without burdening and learning while being respectful of people's time in the directions people are pulled in. Um, and then there's a question about staff culture. So when you take a trust-based approach um, in your work and your learning and evaluation efforts follow, they're you know rigorous, they're robust. Have you noticed anything in your staff culture around what does that create for your people? So the first question is about quantitative, qualitative. One is about, uh, again, robustness versus based on grant scope. Uh, this, the question about grantee burden, and then there's a question about culture, uh, cult, culture change as you do this work uh, within, your, within your teams. Um, I'll throw the quant qual one out there first. Um, and I will also say um, with about 15 minutes to go that you're welcome to, to jump in 
where the questions resonate. But those are the, the four that are really bubbling up right now. And hi, Phil's cat. <laughs> so we live our lives horizontally. Yeah. Right? Hudson says hello. Right. Uh, happy to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Well, I want to jump in and answer all of them, <laughs> but I know we don't have enough time. I, so I'm going to do like speed dial uh, kind of format, quantitative versus qualitative. I, I think uh, you, you can do both. You have to be creative about where it makes sense to collect quantitative data and where it makes sense to create qualitative. And I think that's going to vary. Um, level of engagement for us, um, it does depend on grant size. So we're not going to overburden a grantee that has a very small grant from us versus a, a larger initiative grantee that has multi-year hundreds of thousands of dollars connected to it. Um, and I would say that it, it, uh, it is different in that we're not only engaging at these conversations, coffee hour things that we do, but also in the day-to-day -day engagement. So our larger initiative grantees, we have a relationship with them. They call us all the time. We go visit them. We're part of their conversations. We're a thought partner. So um, it's very different than some of our um, smaller grantees where we only engage at the, at the coffee um, chat. Uh, being respectful of grantee time. I think this is the paradigm shift that we've had at Headwaters or I've had maybe I should say. Um, before I was a grant maker um, that uh, was um, expecting to learn a lot through my grantee reports. And now I'm a um, grant maker that actually has a relationship with grantees and they share more with me than I've ever been shared with before. Um, and so they actually want to spend the time with us as opposed to seeing it as a burden because we're being a thought partner, a connector, a leverager of resources. So it's a very different relationship. And I think it's allowed us to flip the paradigm on are we a burden? Um, and then staff culture work. Uh, my team at Headwaters is probably the happiest team that I've led in philanthropy because we have redefined the role to be part of being a partner with our grantees as opposed to serving the board. Thank you for that, Brenda. Yeah, I, I would echo that about staff culture is that one of the questions that I, because you know we, all three of us speak a lot about uh, trust-based philanthropy and get the question that, how do people manage, you know, it's like you know, they're doing their jobs and they're putting their dockets together and then you want them to have relationships on top of that. And that's really not what we're talking about. It's, it's about completely rethinking the, the job that you have. And it's not about being on this docket treadmill and then, oh gosh, I've got to make phone calls and, and, and talk to people on top of that. It's about taking away the docket treadmill and instead the work is the relationships because the learning happens because of the relationships. And um, I find that our staff, they are energized, they're fed by the work that they're doing, that they don't, you know, it's sure that there's a lot of it. And sometimes it can, you know, you have a lot of relationships, it can feel burdensome, but it's um, fascinating and interesting. And also because we are always in this iterative process, we're always tinkering with what we're doing. It's not that we suddenly, you know, that we do everything and then we stop at a five-year mark and have a massive evaluation of what we're doing and then implement what, you know, what we've learned from the, um, from the massive evaluation. It's that we're constantly, you know, bringing things from the feedback loop into the work that we're doing and making little adjustments and changes and, um, and hopefully making it better. And then our grant partners see that we're responsive and we're listening to them and we are making changes and that makes them trust us, um, trust us even more. And so it's this, um, once you start down this path and build on it, it, um, it makes for really gratifying work. For sure, I'll just jump on the, the staff and board, staff culture, oops. Um, I think the big thing for us is, um, and we all talk about that, but actually um, trust-based philanthropy isn't just um, the grant making part, right? It is um, certainly our relationship with our grantee partners, but it's also our relationship with one another on staff and actually our board's relationship with us and the other way around as well. And it actually takes all of those systems working in concert for kind of 
this to all work. And I think that's what you're hearing kind of from what Brenda and Carrie are all saying, right? We, we are all taking this learning stance from my board sort of saying, okay, mm -hmm. let's do this. Let's experiment with this from how we all keep refining our own processes that we're looking at around um, learning and evaluation. And so I think that whole lens or that whole approach is embodied across these organizations that uh, we represent and uh, many others for sure. And I think that's part of the power and the really amazing part of this is that when they are all kind of in that kind of space in, in unison, if you will, or complementary in that way, there's like a really interesting thing that can kind of get started. Thank you. We're getting this question about how, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Can you share your resources? Where's chat? Can you send me that? Can you send me the longitudinal studies? Can you send me the theory of change? And I uh, just wanna remind that we will share resources um, following as well as a recording, as well as the opening slides. And I'm gonna pass it to Shadi, who's gonna say a word about those who may have been moved or are learning about trust-based philanthropy for the first time. How do folks get connected, Shadi? What are the opportunities? What's the best way to do that? Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. I, I always learn something new, um, even though I have the pleasure of, of working with these folks on a regular basis. Um, yes, yeah, so um, there are a few ways of getting in, engaged. Um, Caitlin just mentioned the peer exchange in the chat, um, and hopefully she can pull up a link to join. We do have a trust-based philanthropy peer exchange where we regularly process these kinds of questions together. Um, so if you have really, it can, there's no question too big or small for this peer listserv. That's a great way to connect with other colleagues who are on the trust-based journey. Um, and there's a lot of sharing that goes on there. And we also have options to pose questions anonymously um, if you don't feel comfortable kind of sharing something that feels kind of private. So a number of ways to engage in that way. We are um, really attempting to produce programming like this that is uh, responsive to the questions that you all have. So the tell us more, what do you want? What, what are we not doing enough of? Um, what have you heard enough of that you don't wanna hear about anymore? And we will respond. We, we have a, a great page of resources that um, show samples of some of the things that you heard about today. We have um, templates and tools, lots of ways that you can engage. Um, and then we also have opportunities to bring leaders like Brenda, Carrie, and Phil to present to your board. So if there's an opportunity where you really want to make the case or kind of move things forward, um, sometimes hearing from another leader that's done this work can go a long way in making that case. So we're here to support you in that way as well. So lots of opportunities. We have um, we have a survey that I hope you will fill out just to tell us what you thought about today's program and what we can do to support you in your journey. Um, and of course, we will share everything after this. We're gonna review all the chat and kind of pull all the resources that were mentioned and make sure that you have access to all that. But this is a learning, we, we are a learning community. As you hear from our speakers today, um, this, we are all learning out loud. So the more learning out loud we can do collectively, the more we can collectively advance this, this practice and, and this, this approach. I so appreciate the feedback and the insights that everyone is sharing because we have a lot of leaders um, in today's room, in the room today that have actively worked through a lot of these questions and are also applying some really innovative and creative approaches to learning. So, um, you know, it's the collective wisdom that will help us um, move move this boulder up the hill. So really just wanna express a lot of gratitude um, to all of you and a lot of gratitude to Shara for giving us some, really shaping this in the, the context of evaluation. We are talking about, not, we're not talking about losing the rigor. You know, this is not this, as you can hear, there's a lot of depth and rigor and, and a rigorous approach to learning and embodying it in every aspect, every step of the way, the way we do our work. Um, and that in and of itself is a paradigm shift. But as you hear, it opens up these like amazing learnings and it moves us out of just focusing on really narrow short term things that aren't allowing us to see the full picture. So um, I could go on, but I'm gonna stop. <laughs> um, and, and maybe in our remaining time, we could just hear, I don't know if, if our speakers have just 
one just like if there was one takeaway that folks had from today's conversation what what would you invite folks to, to walk away with uh, from today's conversation I'm gonna do one as the moderator here. And so here's mine is for those uh, who are thinking about how do we move an evaluation and learning here, and maybe you're a program officer or an executive director, you can ask for different things and ask for more from your evaluation and learning partners. The industry standard that we unsettled today, and we talked about learning and unlearning and the ongoing, there are organizations and individuals, entities, folk um, who are ready to work with you and who will walk it with you. And I would encourage folks to take a look at the equitable evaluation framework as a really aligned uh, frame for that I would say goes really um, quite, quite handily with what is being discussed here um, as folks are looking at um, how do we move in this work who might some of the like-minded people be as an example, but you are allowed to ask for something different, something more that is aligned with what you're hearing today. You do not have to accept the industry standard way as what it has to be, must be forevermore. And so lead from where you are, step into your agency and see what's possible and ask. Ask people to get curious with you. Any other final comments from our other speakers before we knock off a little early? I think we're complete. We are complete. Thank you. Thank you to Shara for the beautiful moderation. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to you all for being with us today, sticking with us, staying so engaged. I, we could feel that energy. We know, you know, it's hard to stay totally focused in these kind of programs and um, just have so much gratitude for you all. So just another final little plug to fill out our survey. Um, and we will send a follow-up email with all the stuff. So you will, you will get access to all the things that you want. And if you don't get it, if you don't get exactly what you're looking for, you can always reach out to the Trust Based Philanthropy Project. We are happy to support you. Um, and with that, we will end a little bit early so that you can get a breather before you go on to your next meeting. So thank you everyone, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.